remembered. So welcome everybody. Thank you for, for joining. Um, we are the Community Share Scotland team. So I, I'm Toby and I'm a development officer in the team. I'm joined by my colleague Katie and we're also joined by Steph Harris from Noidart, uh, who's involved with the um, Community Share offer for the Old Forge pub in Noida, and she'll be speaking later about their experiences with that. Um, so the aim of this today is to be a really broad introduction to crowdfunding and community shares. So Katie will kick us off with, with a bit about crowdfunding and then I'll speak more specifically about community shares and then we'll, we'll hear from Steph. Um, please stop us as we go with questions. We want it to be quite interactive, especially because it's quite a small group. Uh, don't, feel, don't feel bad about interrupting um, if you do have a burning question. Either just speak out or, or put it in the chat, whichever you're most comfortable with. Um, is it worth, shall we do a quick round of introductions of the group, just some sort of small group, um, maybe starting with you, Audrey? Off Hi, I'm Audrey Dunn, I'm Development Officer for DTAS and I cover the, the North and the Islands. Thank you. And Lucy? Hello, I'm Lucy Conway. I'm, I live on the Isle of Egg, where I'm a director of the Isle of Egg Heritage Trust. I'm here today with my work hat on, which is I work for Inspire in Scotland as the Island Communities Fund Manager. Oh, and apologies in advance, I have to leave about 10 to 3. No problem. Okay, no problem. And other Lucy? Hello, I'm Lucy. I'm the Membership and Engagement Officer at DTAS, so I work with Early Stage Development Trust. Thank you. And Ruby? Hi, um, I am a development officer for the Strumness Community Development Trust based up in Orkney. I love it. Thank you, Ruby. And Sarah? I'm Sarah and I'm the Fund Support Officer for the Outdoor Community Play Fund at Inspire in Scotland. So we work across Scotland. Brilliant. Thank you. And last but not least, Ulla. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm a volunteer at Pinnacle Community Development Trust, and uh, I'm just curious to find out what shares really. I don't know if they, whether that's the way we should go or crowdfunding. Perfect. We're in the right place then. Thank yeah. you for joining. We, we'll be a wee whistle stop tour of both for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just going to share my screen and we'll just get started. Hopefully just anyone stick their hand up if it doesn't work. I was saying I'm a little bit of a rookie on this, so sometimes it, you know, doesn't always go to plan. As in not starting on the right slide. So, yes, hello, my name's Katie. I'm the Programme and Comms Officer for Community for Scotland. Obviously, Toby's introduced himself. Um, we're a small, quite a small team of three, and we are a programme that sits within uh, the Development Trust Association Scotland and our uh, programme kind of focuses on raising awareness of um, alternative kind of community finance models so mainly community shares but also touching on crowdfunding and, and community bonds. Uh, we as a programme we kind of deliver training to kind of intermediary partners and um, work quite closely with uh, organisations like the National Law today. We've got a partnership in place with the Plunkett Foundation and Cooperative Cooperative Development Scotland, um, and we also provide direct support to communities. And the good news is that is all fully funded. So we are funded by the Scottish Government and a couple of other kind of smaller funders, and that enables our um, programme to kind of offer early stage support. Um, if you're thinking about a community share offer, and also at the moment we're kind of piloting some crowdfunding support as well for um, members of DTAS. So our support, it covers quite a broad range of things and we've listed a few here, but it's probably not, you know, completely, you know, it's not the most extensive amount that we do. So we offer up to three, six tailored days of free consultancy around business planning. Um, so putting the kind of business plan together and we work with some other consultants that we can kind of pull in to, to support with that. And um, we can also support with community engagement and how you can get your community involved and educated about shares and how you can market that um, and how you can consult with the community. 
We also offer support on governance and you know what the kind of structure you would need for setting up um, a community share offer. And we're quite lucky, obviously, in DSAS that we um, can pull on the support of lots of our colleagues who have in the wider team with uh, DSAS and COS, so lots of different um, knowledge there. We also offer kind of practical support on putting your share offer documents together and Toby will touch a bit more on um, you know what's involved with that um, as we kind of get into more of what community shares actually are. Um, and then we also can offer um, a micro grant of up to £5,000 so that's kind of you know for additional costs um, to cover say if you're running your campaign you want to do a, a launch event for your share offer, marketing costs like putting a video together, um, a tax relief a support or legal support as well so we, we, we can offer quite a lot um, and as I said it's all fully funded which is great. So we are going to talk about community shares but I think first of all we kind of thought we'll talk about crowdfunding because essentially community shares are a kind of form of crowdfunding um, there's basically crowdfunding is obviously a way of kind of raising finance um, and asking a large amount of people for you know small amount of money and I'm pretty sure we've all probably uh, you know donated in our time to different crowdfunding campaigns. Um, there's two kind of different types there's unregulated and regulated so there's your kind of typical donation crowdfunding which is um, you know people kind of invest in, in a cause because they, they believe in it you can put forward, you know, a kind of small amount of money and you don't necessarily expect anything back. Um, and then there's reward crowdfunding, which is very similar again, but you can be offered a reward. So I think obviously or, uh, Stephanie might kind of touch on this, but the, the old Forge were excellent at offering some really attractive um, rewards to people who donated to them. Um, and then you've got your, your more regulated form of crowdfunding, which is kind of, I suppose, where community shares fits in a little bit more. So investors would put money in. Um, generally speaking, it would be into something like a, you know, a social investment. So still for a cause that they believe in, but getting money back with, in, so with interest. Uh, so a kind of financial return. Um, I've listed a couple of platforms for each of these, to be honest. Um, but there's there's quite a you know a few different ones. We tend not to recommend you know specific ones necessarily. And then there's equity crowdfunding. So that is um, giving people a chance to invest in um, an opportunity in, in exchange for for equity. Uh, so money can be exchanged for shares or a kind of small stake um, in the project. So if it's helpful, we can send round the links for these, or we can put them in the chat as well. So. I guess the question is, why would you run a crowdfunding campaign? Well, first and foremost, obviously, it's to raise money um, for your project. Um, I think, obviously, there's quite a lot of different reasons, and I think there's there's benefits to running a crowdfunding campaign that are not just monetary. Uh, we know that it can really help generate a kind of PR response and a lot of publicity. And again, the Old Forge, you know, as well as running a, a community shares, um, of community share offer they also did run a crowdfunding campaign and it received a lot of kind of engagement so there's things like it can increase traffic to your website and social media so it's just generally quite a good way of raising awareness of what you're trying to do um, it can also help identify your kind of most engaged supporters and followers and I think going forward that's that can be quite important for kind of growing um, awareness of what you're trying to do and you know your, the supporters that you have might become Customers, if you're wanting to open a community shop or um, repeat, you know, donors or just people who are happy to kind of champion your your project and what you're what you're doing, um, and it can also help to lend sort of credibility to funders, suppliers, and and potential partners. Um, so this is a bit of a whistle stop here, but sort of in terms of managing your campaign, I think um, what we've noticed with a lot of kind of campaigns and is you know it's good to have quite a clear marketing plan so making sure that you have the time and resources to implement a marketing plan is quite important because it probably takes a wee bit more time than you might think and again that's something that we can probably support with um, if, if you were looking for advice on that it's really quite important uh, and really beneficial to kind of utilize if you have any volunteers in your project and board and board member skills because generally speaking you know, people tend to have quite a lot of untapped um, skills that they're maybe not, uh, you know, always sharing with with people. So, 
Have you got young people in your community who are really good at social media? Have you got board members who've got experience in marketing or PR? You know, those are the kind of things that are quite helpful to think about. And again, it's the same for a community share offer as it is for a crowdfunding um, campaign. It's probably quite wise to set an achievable target. So, um, you know, it's good to have sort of pie in the sky thinking, but I think it's good to be realistic as well. Generally speaking, crowdfunding campaigns and Toby would probably be good at giving an idea of what a, a realistic figure would be. Obviously, it depends on your 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 project, but kind of set it within a, a, a kind of reasonable limit that you think you could potentially raise. And we're, we've got a, a, a bit of a case study just at the end that I can that I can share with you. I think as well the it all kind of depends in terms of how much you can raise on the size of what your existing networks are. And again, that's usually something that's quite good to get your volunteers and your board members involved in, you know, who are um, your networks, who do people know that can, can that will, you know, pledge to your campaign? How can you kind of raise the, the visibility of your campaign and the attractiveness of what you're trying to do? Um, so there's there's quite a lot of different factors that it can, that it can depend on. In terms of Rewards. I think we touched on, or I touched on the fact that the the old forge they um, put some really attractive rewards forward, and I think that was probably quite a, a big reason of why their crowdfunding campaign was quite successful. I'm sure. I don't know, Steph. Hopefully, Stephanie would agree with me on that. Um, but I think it's 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 sensible to kind of use your rewards wisely. So even if it's something like you're offering, um, you know, a bar of chocolate, that's a very basic example. It's you have to be able to fulfill it and ensure that it's not going to stress out potentially a small team to, to kind of fulfill that. So it's just thinking about what's manageable for you. And it might could be as simple as, you know, sending people out a postcard or a, a kind of, you know, quarterly update or something like that. I think another good idea is to research match funding. And what we found recently is that some count, different councils are doing um, match funding for crowdfunding campaigns. I think Perth and Can Ross might be one that are actually putting forward, you know, if, if you are planning running a campaign, they will potentially match fund what you raise to a, to a certain limit. Um, when we worked with the case study that I'll talk through in a minute, they applied for, that was in Fife, and they applied for match funding. Unfortunately, they didn't actually hear back from the council, so it can be a little bit hit and miss, but... Um, we would certainly recommend that you look into that because uh, that could be, de be a potential source of just upping the amount of money that you, you manage to raise. And then lastly, I think in terms of managing the campaign, it's it's wise to be prepared for a lot of questions around what you're, you know, where the money is going to go, uh, what it's going to be spent on. Um, and that kind of thing, because I think people obviously like to, as much as people like to invest in, or donate and things, they also quite like to know where their money is going to go. So sharing, making sure that, you know, on your crowdfunding campaign page, you, you're happy to, to do regular updates um, and answer people's questions and making sure that you have the, the resource to do that. Um, so one, we've really recent, only really recently started offering kind of crowdfunding support in Scotland the Bread were a pilot of ours. We helped them, we supported them back in October last year as they were looking to raise around £20,000 to expand their community engagement projects. So Scotland the Bread are a, a project based in Fife who ran a community share offer a number of years ago but they were looking to kind of expand what they're doing at the moment and, and their aim is they they want to grow better grain um kind of more sustainably and bake bread that's you know tar you know actually targeted towards being kind of nourishing and sustainable uh, and for communities where typically it might just be a, a white loaf that, that people would be able to afford it's about making good bread affordable essentially so they ran their campaign for six weeks and they have actually left it open for further donations as well. They managed to raise about £22,000 um, and as I said, that money is going to be used to expand their community engagement projects in schools and expanding into other kind of communities uh, than they are at the moment. They, they offered a range of different rewards from about £5 upwards. So I think the £5 was, um, I think, a... Uh, 
uh, they were planning to show a, a film that was kind of related to to bread making and so they they charged five pounds so that people could have a, a, a kind of free ticket to to watch the 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 documentary I think it was um, and then upwards the kind of upper reward they had was about a thousand pounds and that was for people to go and get a tour of their they've got a, a mill in East Lothian so uh, they were going to offer to a tour and a uh, kind of a bit more of a hands-on experience of you know making the bread um, with uh, some of the staff um, I can put the link to the crowdfunder in the the chat, but um, it's, it's, it's a good example of, you know, a kind of smaller achievable amount of money, um, £20,000, they, and they were quite good at kind of reaching out to, to kind of uh, networks that they had in, uh, already uh, to kind of get that pre-pledge of money so that when the campaign actually launched, they, they were able to raise or kind of hit their target or actually push a bit beyond their target, which was, I think, £20,000. So... That was a, a quite a quick run through. So has anybody got any questions? I'll stop sharing just now. No. Any questions before we move on to the community share stuff, folks? Um no. yes, I have one. Do people offer um rewards like um with a pub or a shop, you would get money off once it was got started. Like you, you'd get a card and you'd get some kind of benefit like that. Is that do they offer rewards like that? Yeah, I think something like that would be quite a good idea. I think anything that people can kind of see that they can use, you know, going forward, um, somewhere would be would be quite a, a good idea. Um, I think it's anything that obviously people are donating, but they. I, I think we all probably like to feel that we're getting something back. So I think anything small like that, and again, that would probably be quite an easy one to fulfill because you could probably say, right, well, if you've donated, we can just post you a card and hopefully the cost wouldn't be too much for that. Yep, so there's Stephanie saying that one of their rewards was a discount card. So yep. It's a really the only thing, thing you have to be mindful with with that is that you don't want to offer too big a discount because it, yeah. you know you have to cost it into your business plan. And if you have however many hundred people getting for 10, 15 percent off in the shop, it can really impact your income. So you have to be careful about making sure that you don't offer a reward that's worth too much. Yeah. Uh, Lucy, do you have a question as well? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's it might this might be a red herring. So forgive me if I'm confusing. Mm -hmm. Ignoring ignoring gift aid and um and you know whether uh whether you're a charity or not, but uh, for a lot of organisations that are charitable, they can only do certain things within their constitution. Um, you know, so for example, a village hall is about providing you know social opportunities for people to gather, come together. But often they come a cropper if they run a bar, and the income that comes in from the bar is so significant that they lose their charitable status. Mm -hmm. Is is there is there anything related to um, to crowdfunding? Which which people should bear in mind in, in relation to um, rewards and, and so yeah. on. Yeah, so you're right to flag gift aid. If you are a charity, you can get gift aid, and it's worth noting that you can still get gift aid while offering small rewards. Um, but it needs to be at a certain limit, so we can share the guidance on that. But you're right. If you're offering rewards that are quite substantial, it, it can be considered as trading. And what you see a lot of people using the crowdfunding campaign for is to essentially uh, launch a product. So you might have a product that's pre-production, you've not started making it yet, but you say, if enough people buy this, we'll, we'll put it into production and we'll make it. And that quite often happens for kind of new technology, sometimes for books that haven't gone into print yet. Um, and that the money you make from that would be considered trading income. So as a charity, you need to be very careful to make sure that you're still within your charitable um, you know what to still passing the charity test for Oscar um, and that's something that you probably need to take professional advice on if, if you were running a, a big big campaign it'd be, it'd be worth making sure that you are still going to be passing the charity test and would that be with Oscar or would that be with crowdfunder it would be Oscar that you need to clear it with yeah yeah I've never thought about it before it was just when you were talking about all the different different um, rewards it suddenly occurred to me yeah Sorry, I said I mean, it would, it would need to be, in most cases, it would need to be a very big campaign for it to have that, that level of impact. But I suppose the Village Hall is a good example of, of where they might not have huge income as it is. And if yeah. you have a massive crowdfunding campaign alongside it, it could skew things quite a lot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Katie, do you mind putting the slides back up 
Um, I think I can move through them myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so Katie's spoken about crowdfunding more generally. I'm going to speak about community shares, which are essentially a form of crowdfunding. Um, they're a way to raise money for community enterprises um, and they have community ownership built into them. People are, are putting their money in, not as a donation, but as, a, as an investment. So the idea is that somebody might buy, say, £100 worth of shares. Once the organisation has established its, its business idea, um, they can then get that money back. If they put £100 in, they can get £100 back. Um, it's Katie kind of showed the different types of crowdfunding earlier, and this fits a little bit between the regulated and unregulated areas. Community groups have <clears throat> have scope to kind of get access to capital that previously was only really available to, to private businesses and private companies. Um, so it's a really flexible way to raise money, and it can it can help to, to launch all sorts of things. We've worked with with community shops, with community pubs, as, as Steph will talk about later. Um, we're starting to see more housing projects. In the past, we had a lot of renewable energy projects and really anything that a group of people can, can put together a business case for and convince a community to invest in can be funded this way and, and you can raise all sorts of sums of money. Um, some key facts about, about this. To issue community shares, you have to be um, either a community benefit society or a cooperative society. In most cases that we work with, it, it's a community benefit society. Both of them are a particular legal structure, and I'll speak about them in more detail in the next slide. Um, but what's common among them is that the people who buy shares become members, and as members, they have a democratic say over how things are run. They can um, stand for election to the management committee. They can vote for who does stand, who, who does get elected. Um, and that works on a one member, one vote principle. So it aims to be very democratic, regardless of how much money someone puts in, whether they put in 10 pounds or 10,000 pounds, they both should have an equal voice in, in how things are run. Um, community shares are, are, the technical name for them is withdrawable share capital. So when you put money in, it's not like having a share in, in Apple or Amazon. It's not going to go up in value. It's not going to be tradable on a stock market. It's a bit more like having money in a bank account. If you put £100 in, you can withdraw that £100, but you can't sell that share and you, you can't make a profit on the share itself. But investors can be incentivized in other ways, so they can receive tax relief on their share. Uh, in most cases, that can be around 30% of their investment. And they can be given annual interest, um, which is a, always a fairly modest sum. The highest I've seen it go in Scotland is about 5%. A recent average has probably been about 1% to 2%. Um, but the idea is that people shouldn't lose money by investing in, in a community share offer. Um, and they can be incentivized enough that they can be, be willing to put money in. But the main reason people invest should be that they want to support something that has a social purpose and is going to do good for their community. Community shares can be a great way to attract further funding. So most of the community share offers that we support um, will have other funding alongside, quite often grant funding, uh, in some cases uh, loans or, or donations. Uh, and you know it's very commonly the case that community shares make up that kind of last piece of the jigsaw that helps you get over the line and, and find all the money you need. Um, just a little bit more on, on community benefit societies. Like I said, Typically, we work with community benefit societies and not cooperative societies. The key difference between the two is that a co-op co exists for the benefit of its members and, and really its members alone, whereas community benefit society has to demonstrate benefit to a wider community. Um, and for that reason, a community benefit society fits really well with a lot of the community work that happens in Scotland and that DTAS, uh, the Development Trust Association, supports. Um, so community benefit societies are eligible for the Scottish Land Fund, they're eligible for powers like community right to buy and community asset transfer, and really every major grant fund that I'm aware of, and in fact, every grant funder that I'm aware of will accept the community benefit society. Um, they can also be charitable, so where you are undertaking charitable activity, as a community benefit society, you can get charitable status. And there's various options for if you have an existing organisation, say, for example, you're already established as a company limited a guarantee or a ski or a charitable organisation, you have options there. You can either convert a company to become society 
or you have an option to kind of connect uh, the existing organisation with a newly formed society. And that's something that Community Health Scotland can offer a lot of advice on. And we have particular model rules, governing documents that, that we can we can use that are really well suited to development trusts. Um, so Community Shared Scotland has been around since 2014 and in that time we've supported 50 completed share offers, in fact that might be 51 now, and um, we've got two that are just close to closing at the moment. Um, between them they've raised around £80 million pounds in community shares, brought in almost £28 million in, in other funds, and uh, over 15,000 people in Scotland have, have now invested in community share offers. So it seems to be a really growing market. It seems to be something that's growing in recognition and, and popularity. And a lot more groups are coming to us with, with inquiries about how they can how they can make use of it. Um, I've got a few examples here and then we'll, we'll move on to Steph's particular uh, story for, from Old Fort, Build Forge. Um, but firstly, we've got um, the Loch Ness Hub in Drumland Rocket and Katie's actually been up visiting them this week, filming a video with them. So she might know more than I do. <laughs> uh, but they raised £110,000 in uh, 2020 they were actually the first share offer to launch after covid that we saw um, and they used that money to purchase a existing private business in in the community um, and it's a baggage handling service that, that moves people's bags around between walking trails uh, near Loch Ness um, and the income from that will help to fund a local community transport hub um, so the, the transport hub itself is you know mostly charitable mostly community led it doesn't make much money but the income from the baggage handling service allows it to run as a sustainable um, business um, and that made use of the the DTAS hybrid model rules so that's where an existing development trust has a cl closely connected to community benefit society and the two work really closely together um, and they also receive Scottish land fund money to purchase the the building that they operate from Next one we've got here is Razay Community Renew Renewables. So this was the, the most recent of our 10 community hydro projects that have been funded through community shares. Um, and there is £665,000. So renewable energy projects really do tend to be the, the biggest in terms of the money raised and also in terms of the money offered. Uh, in this case, shareholders receive up to 5% interest. Um, and that helped them to install two electric hydroelectric turbines locally um, and all the profits from that after they've paid back investors and, and covered other costs all the profits will be reinvested locally in, into com community benefit and, and go into all sorts of other community projects. Um, final example for you is Common Ground Against Homelessness so this is a group in Edinburgh who raised £715,000 um, with which they bought a property in Edinburgh that they're going to um, renovate and turn around and use to, to provide uh, housing for nine previously homeless men um, and they do what's called what they call homes for life it's essentially supported accommodation for people who've, who've had a history of living on the street and maybe need some help to get back into um, you know living in, in a in accommodation again um, but they've put together a business plan where shareholders receive five percent interest so they hope that it's a really scalable, sustainable model that will help them to move away from requiring grants and donations. Um, and they hope that they'll do future share offers to take on more properties. Um, we have some final tips here, just for either crowdfunding or community shares. Um, these are our kind of basic, basic three top tips, but obviously there is more to it. And like Katie said, we, we've got a lot of free support available that you can come to us um, to access. But our, our key tips for a successful crowdfunding or community share offer campaign, firstly, are to have a clear sell. Um, and that is to make sure that you and everyone else who's involved in the campaign can, can speak about it really consistently. Um, you might have heard of a elevator pitch, which is the kind of concept that if you've got a business plan or you've got an investment proposal, you should be able to talk about it in the 15 or 20 seconds that you might get with an important person during an elevator ride. Um, so having those uh, clear messages down to maybe one or two sentences that you can fall back on, just saying exactly what you're looking to do and why people should invest. Um, the next one is about building your audience. I think a lot of the time when people see a crowdfunding campaign, they see that it runs for maybe five weeks, six weeks, and they think that all the work happens in that time. Actually, the most successful campaigns do a lot of legwork before that. They have a lot of their biggest supporters already sort of pledged to give money. And the rule of thumb that we hear is, is that 
the really successful campaigns have at least around a third of the money pledged before they go live. Um, and that means they can really hit the ground running and, and have a lot of momentum behind them once they do launch. Um, and our final tip is to be relentless. Uh, this, is, this is our program managers, manager Marvin's wording. I think it comes from a few of the, the early community shares, um, <coughs> community shares Scotland projects where they really did just have one key figurehead or a, a few key people who essentially made it their life for the, the few weeks of the campaign, pestered all their family, pestered all their friends. Every time they met a neighbour in, in the post office queue, they were talking about their community share campaign, making sure people thought about it. And it does take for a lot of people that few asks. I think people say it takes up to seven times being asked before people do actually commit and, and put the money in. So you do need to have that willingness to badger people to, to really make the most of it. Um, so that's the run through from Community Share Scotland. Happy to take questions now or happy to move on to the, the old Forge stuff if you'd like. Uh, there we go. All dying to hear from Steph. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I I've got a question, um, which probably can't be answered properly anyway. But um, if you have an area, a small town like uh, Pennycook, and you already have had a major uh, community shares project, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, um, about food. Yeah. And, you know, what, what we would be involved in is not uh, anything like that. It would be historical heritage and uh, printing and uh, um, uh, tourist information, maybe, things like that. And I, I just, uh, I could see that it would be a backhill, um, a really difficult battle to introduce something to a community already uh, very much engaged in, in, in um, another yeah, similar. It's, it's a really good question. We, we do have a few examples of communities that have had multiple share offers. So in Dunbar, there's a community bakery and a, a community greengrocer. In Strontian, in the West Coast, there's a, a community hydro project and a community school building. Um, and, and there's a couple other examples where a community had multiple share offers. It, it does depend on the community, though, um, and I think those both those places probably do have a little bit of wealth in them. I, I'm not sure if the same goes for Pennycook. And I suppose in both those cases, all the share offers previously were very successful, and I think there was a good reputation behind them. Uh, you you know, it depends on people's experiences with with community shares, but I, I wouldn't rule it out. I don't think it's impossible, and I think the idea is that people get this money back, so it shouldn't matter too much that they've done it before. It is still an investment, and if you put together a good proposal people would hopefully still be attracted to it. Thank you. No problem. Any more questions before we move on to Steph's bit? No, okay, over to you, Steph. Okay, I'm just gonna try share my screen. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Apologies for the voice, I'm not well at the moment, but we'll, we'll power through. <clears throat> Can you all see that? Is that going to work? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> uh, hi, I'm Steph Harris. Uh, thanks for asking me to speak today. Uh, I'm the Business Development Manager for the Old Forge CBS, and uh, this will probably take about 10 minutes to get through. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, how we managed to bring the old forge under community ownership and how shares and crowdfunding played a part in that. <clears throat> so a bit of background, if you're not kind of aware of who we are or what we've done, uh, we're situated on the Noidark Peninsula, which is in Lochaber in the Highlands. Um, even though we're on the mainland, we've got no road connection. So the only way to reach us is by ferry or for the hardy people, a three day walk over the hills. Uh, we've got a population of about 110 people and it's very much a kind of island way of life for us here. <clears throat> uh, community ownership isn't new to us. Um, in 99 we became one of the first uh, land buyouts um, in Scotland just a couple of years after Egg um, and 23 years later we're going from strength to strength and uh, the Nydark Foundation's at the helm managing the land on behalf of the community. 
Uh, Noida is very much a popular tourist destination. I've got all the usual kind of amenities that you would expect from a small village. We've got shop, post office, tea room, restaurants, and of course the Old Forge, which is our only pub. Um, the pub was built on the site of the old blacksmith's forge, hence the name. And in the 60s or 70s, it was established as a workers club uh, by one of the previous landowners. Uh, and then it went on to become a kind of pub restaurant and had various private owners over the years. Uh, it's just a few photos in case you don't, haven't seen Noidart before. Uh, this is Inverie Bay where the main village is. As you can see, we're blessed with some lovely scenery, but it's not always as good as it looks in these photos, particularly today. <coughs> Uh, so before I go on to how we managed to kind of fund and purchase the pub, I wanted to give a quick overview of uh, our timeline over the last 14 months. So we started in January last year uh, when the community were told that the pub was going up for sale. We held a local consultation to find out if folks thought that a buyout might be something that we should go for. And the result was really supportive. Uh, and then we got to work, we put together the steering group, created a fundraising plan and working out all the other things that go into a project like this, such as kind of registering the CBS, trying to get a bank account, which took another, um, and creating the business plan. Uh, the second half of the year was when things really started to kind of pick up. Uh, we began working on the community share offer, uh, submitted applications to, the, to some public funds, and we were really fortunate that all of our plans kind of came together within a few months of each other. Um, and by November, we were in a position to submit an offer to the seller. <coughs> um, following around four months of what felt like never ending negotiations, uh, at the end of March this year, we finally got the keys. And that's when the real work began, I think, trying to figure out how to go from buying a pub to managing and running it. And um, that's a whole other story. But it's fair to say that everything is going really well so far. And we've been trading for about two months now. So going back to the fundraising, our plan had kind of three main strands. So the first was public funding, and we submitted applications to the Scottish Land Fund and the new UK Government Community Ownership Fund. Our hope uh, was that these two combined would form the backbone of the funds to buy the pub and also to support a lot of the refurb works that were needed. And then the other two strands were a community share offer and a crowdfund campaign. We decided to go with community shares because it would mean that local investors would have a direct involvement in kind of future decision making and the structure would also allow us to receive larger investments whilst retaining quite a balanced kind of level of community control. Uh, we realised that even if the public funds and the share offer came together as we had hoped we would still have a bit of a shortfall so the final piece was to run a crowdfund campaign at the end to make up any difference and um, it would also give some of the hundreds of supporters that we knew we had out with Noider at the chance to be involved. So community shares. <clears throat> the minimum figure that we identified in the business plan we needed to raise through the share offer was just over 200,000. Um, we realised that for a community of only around 110 odd people it would be quite the ask to raise that kind of money. Um, some of the other challenges that we faced when working at the structure was uh, how to retain community control in terms of the shareholder balance and also keeping it affordable to everyone whilst making sure that we could raise quite a substantial sum. So after a lot of back and forth and a lot of input from Toby in particular, um, the solutions we came up with was first to have two member types. So we had type A shareholders, which were now residents, and type B who were not residents but had an interest in the project. Uh, we also decided that 75% of the overall shareholder members must be made up of type A members to retain that kind of community control. And the final, probably most crucial decision was to have different minimum investment amounts for each uh, shareholder type. So the minimum investment amount for type A and B were very different. It was £25 for locals and £10,000 for non-locals. <clears throat> um, the B shares were so high because of the kind of 75-25% membership split. So if we had 75 A members, that would mean that we could only have a maximum of 25 B member slots and we had to maximise the amount of investment we could get out of those. Um, we were able to commit to this structure because we knew that we had a few interested parties who wanted to invest larger amounts of money. Um, but it definitely kept us up at night, particularly in the last kind of couple of days before we launched, we were thinking, are we doing the right thing? Um, luckily we did. 
uh, and the response to both A and B member applications was above what we had hoped for. So once we'd kind of settled on the structure, we had, to, we had the prospectus approved, we set to work promoting it. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time building up to the launch and letting locals and other interested parties know that it was coming. We held an event at the community hall on the launch day, which was an opportunity to kind of bring everyone together, highlight the key points that we wanted to make, and also give folk a chance to ask questions. Uh, the share offer paperwork was circulated to everyone before the event, so they had a chance to look at it and come prepared with questions, and that was really helpful on both sides, I think. Um, and we had application forms available, and we managed to raise 91,000 in that first night from locals only, which was above and beyond what we had hoped to kick off with. Uh, during the campaign, we posted regular updates on social media, also kept potential investors updated. We kind of had like a, an email and list of everyone that we thought might be interested, so they got regular updates, and uh, that kind of kept quite a steady trickle of applications coming in. And then the closer we got to reaching the minimum target, the applications definitely picked up. And that was when we decided to increase our maximum target, uh, just because of the level that was coming in and be able to kind of honor all of the applications that we got. So the result was that the campaign closed a week early and we raised just over 256,000. <coughs> So with the success of the public fund applications, which went through and the, the share offer, the final step was a crowdfund to make up the difference. So we decided to use crowdfunder platform because some of us had experience with them before and they were great. Um, and we set a minimum target of 40 grand, which would kind of secure our overall fundraising plan. We were fortunate to have a few folk on the committee who had ran successful crowdfund campaigns before and they pulled everything together, but everyone on the committee had involvement in kind of deciding the rewards. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, our theme for the rewards was pretty focused on community and offering support or something that made them feel like they could put their own stamp on the pub. The name on the bar award was one of the most popular and it was an opportunity to have their name inscribed in our new bar talk when the bar gets redone. Another popular awards was uh, the bar stools, which will have wee name plaques on them, uh, the rogues gallery, uh, which is a collage of supporters' photos. And also the pour a pint. I haven't had anyone come in to take that up yet, but I'm sure they, I'm sure we will. Um, as well as keeping the rewards interesting, we had to balance it and make sure that we offered what we thought folk might want, but also what was affordable and achievable for us uh, to deliver. The campaign launched to coincide with payday, um, as we thought that would give us a boost at the beginning, and it ran for five weeks to catch the next month's payday at the end as well. Um, as with the share offer, we spent lots of time building up interest online so that folk were ready to pledge as soon as it launched, sent out uh, press releases to national media. Um, and the result of our build up, not only for the crowdfunder, uh, but for the project as a whole, kind of promoting that in the prior months meant that the campaign completely blew up and we'd reached our 40 grand target in the first eight hours. And I think we, we ended up finishing just over 66,000 and that uh, we left that running pretty much till the end, shut it down just a couple of days before it was closed. So finally, what, what did we learn? Um, whatever fundraising avenue you're going down, start early, uh, build your online presence, start to get subscribers for newsletter updates and engage with the community as much as possible so that they feel part of the process. I think that's very important. Um, it's also worth spending time identifying who your supporters are, so you can talk to them directly if need be, whether it's for financial support or be prominent local figures who can help spread word about the project. Um, don't be shy about asking folk to plug it. If they believe in it, they will be happy to share a post online because it doesn't cost them anything and it could have a really big impact on the success of it. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, take the time to engage the local community and use every method that you have available to you, whether that's social media, emails, posters, speaking to people, holding events, all that sort of stuff. Uh, the more that people know, I think the more likely they are to support it. Uh, another good tip is establishing your brand and sticking to it throughout. So, for example, maybe getting a logo made up, using the same kind of colour charts, fonts, designs, on your website and through your other kind of promo materials as this will make your project quite recognizable when folk are scrolling through. Um, also taking the time to kind of create 
kind of good content, usually high quality photographs, creating wee short videos can be really good at kind of getting engagement online as well. Um, and as I mentioned before, press releases can also be really helpful in spreading the word. You can easily find journalist email addresses online and uh, you just have to kind of create a mail and list and fire it out. And even if only a couple of them pick up on it, that's still potentially a couple of newspapers that are sharing the story. And finally, don't doubt yourself. It's definitely easier said than done. And we had some very stressful moments throughout the whole thing. But um, yeah, it's just take your time, prepare and commit, and it will definitely be worth it if you put all the, put the work in beforehand. And that's it. Hopefully that was of help. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's worth highlighting for anyone who didn't see the campaign at the time. The Old Forge campaign is probably the most successful one we've seen in terms of hitting its targets, I think, within a week or two weeks, maybe. Um, it was so fast and with <laughs> such a, for such a small community, such a huge amount of money. So really, really impressive. And I think anybody who's looking to do this should look to them, for example. I think they're a perfect case study in, in how to do it well. <coughs> we got any questions? Good luck. Um, yeah, I just wonder, it, it's fantastic what you've done, but how do you keep the momentum? I mean, do, do you get a lot of support still actually coming to use uh, from, to the pub? Because it's so, so very much in the wilderness and... <laughs> yeah, well, I think a lot of the people that, have, that supported it have either been coming for years, um, like kind of for the crowdfunder in particular, people that had a kind of connection to Noidart. Um, we were quite fortunate that Noidart as a whole has kind of got quite a good reputation and a place that people want to come. Um, but we've definitely found that since we got it, it has made people be like, eh, great, I'm coming. I'm going to book my holiday now kind of thing. There's So there's definitely been uh, folk kind of waiting to see it all go through. And then being like, right, I'm coming for a visit, which has been great. And obviously you get the people coming in that had already booked their holidays and things like that. Um, and but even just kind of on a local level, we knew that a lot of the locals would, would return once it was community owned. But the kind of level and the frequency at which they've been going has probably been above what we had hoped, which is great. Thank you. Sounds good. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions at all? Oh, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> is did anyone here? Approach? Sorry, Lucy, you go first. I was just going to ask, but yeah, um, did you have an approach for, um, what was your approach for the type, was it, did you say it was type B shares, the, the really large ones? Um, was it individual, um, approaching individuals and with their particular um, <coughs> tactics that you had? To that um well without kind of getting into personal details it was mainly people that had a connection to Noidart that were obviously on a wee bit more of the wealthier side of the world um, so maybe people that had been coming for ages owned property here that kind of thing um people like a uh, second holiday home owners that sort of thing were are kind of a lot of them are really actively engaged in the community anyway so they were well aware of what was happening they wanted to know how they could get involved and that, that was a way that they could um and just kind of speaking to them when they came up um in person and we also kind of had again like a separate email list for them saying this is this is what's happening if you're interested and you want more info then then get in touch Well, if there's no more questions, folks, I think we can we can wrap up there. Um, we will share all the slides after this, um, and well, not so relevant for people here, but we'll also share the recording. So if you've got colleagues who'd like to, to see it back, we can share the recording as well. Um, and please do get in touch if you've got any projects that you want to talk about or any questions that, that come to you afterwards. Just drop us an email or, or pick up the phone. We're very happy to chat anytime.
I hope that's been helpful. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Steph, for joining us. That was really helpful. Yeah, thank you, Steph. Um, I am looking at logistics of hopefully coming up for the relaunch event in August. Oh, yeah, that'd um, be good. Yeah, and I think Morgan might join as well if she can. Excellent. Yeah, well, spread it around anyone that you think would want to come. That's uh, an open invite to everyone that helps. So, yeah, uh, if, if you need a hand with kind of working anything out, just pop me an email. Yeah, well, I'm looking at whether it's possible to do as like a double header with, with Egg Brewery. Um, cool. but definitely up for doing no doubt on its own if it, if it comes to it but very we'll, good we'll right well keep me posted then well do right, okay thank see you, so you later thanks, thank you thanks Ula. Ula.